All right, Chris, we're live. Hey, everybody. Uh, Jamie Anderson's twin brother, Chris Tangeris here. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna do uh, this is gonna be two things here. One, we're gonna talk about using the data bar in Smart. Uh, so this is not necessarily just about DI, because you'll notice part two, we're gonna talk about Smart DI. Uh, now, the data bar in Smart is the same whether you're in version eight or DI. So we'll start there, and then that'll be a nice segue into talking about Smart DI. So uh, I'm Chris by the way. Uh, so product manager and instructor here at Rational. Uh, this is my first webinar ever, so this is super exciting for me, and I hope you all enjoy however this goes. <laughs> so we're here at Rational, the main office here. Uh, again, uh, if you have any questions on anything that doesn't get answered uh, during the course of this, please email your questions to support at rationalacoustics.com. Uh, it's a great, great way to reach uh, any of us. So. Today, we'll start with the data bar. Uh, we're gonna go through uh, uh, some general operation of it, and then we'll talk about the all important session folder. And then again, we'll switch gears and, and talk about uh, smart DI. When we get to DI, there's gonna be some terminal terminology that I'm gonna mention that hasn't been talked about in the other two webinars that we've created so far. Uh, so for that, I apologize uh, that for some of you, we may be talking about some new terms. The thing is, we're not gonna be necessarily going into depth with what those terms are. We're gonna be concentrating on the configuration of DI and how those terms apply to that. So you'll learn all about transfer function measurements through the course of this series. Uh, all I'm gonna do is show you how to make them in DI so that you can follow along when we get to them later in our webinar series. Anyway, jumping into the data bar. so. We call it the data bar in version 8, uh, as well as DI. Now, the hotkey for showing and hiding the data bar is B. So a little bit of a conceit there. It became the data bar just so you could remember the hotkey a little easier. Um, it's referred to as the data library in the user guide. Uh, if any of you are, are familiar with version 7, we called it the data register in version 7, and I believe uh, programs before 7 as well. So. With data and smart, there's, there's two types of data we have. We have spectrum and transfer function data that uh, we're going to be talking about in this for the purpose of this video. So the type of data that you're looking at is all about plot focus. And I know Jamie covered some plot focus on a previous webinar, but let's just hammer home some of this stuff. So with version 8 here, I have a spectrum data bar in the left hand area and I have an RTA plot in the center uh, and in the right we have a spectrum control bar. If I were to change this plot to a, a magnitude for example which is a transfer function plot type you'll notice that the data bar changed with that view. So now we have transfer function control, transfer function data, transfer function plot. If I were to put two plots and make one of them a spectrum plot like an RTA and then switch between them. We have spectrum plot, spectrum data, spectrum control, transfer function plot, transfer function data, transfer function control. So these interface bars are just linked to the plot and focus. Uh, <clears throat> now, as far as the data that we're creating with Smart, no matter whether you're using a Mac-based operating system or a Windows, based operating system, the location of these traces is always in your documents and then the Smart V8 folder and then traces. Um, once you get there, you'll notice that you have two trace folders, one for spectrum and one for transfer function. Uh, just hey, Chris, can yeah. I jump in real quick? Yeah. Maybe we can switch to the uh, the full screen view so folks can get a better view of the, uh, the interface you're showing off. Not that I don't love them seeing my lovely face. Ah. No problem. First time. So, uh, where were we? Ah, yeah. So this data lives in your documents folder, uh, 
in this case, we're looking at smart eight traces, and then you have spectrum and transfer function. Uh, there's also a folder for DI. Uh, DI is installed in this computer as well, so spectrum transfer function. So what's important to note here is that the data in your interface is not actually in, well, we'll say in SMART. It's actually just on your hard drive, and SMART's reading your documents folder. So if we go to transfer function, you'll notice we have the AA class data, and then here's AA class data in the interface. If I were to delete this um, from SMART, or fr delete this in SMART, or delete this on the hard drive, it's going to go away. Um, I'm not going to do that, however. Uh, so you'll also notice that the order here is not the same order as it is in SMART. Uh, SMART's going to order the, the folders based on when they were created, whereas your computer's documents, I know on a Macintosh anyway, it's going to order them based on alphabetical order. So it can be uh, a bit jumbled. Uh, and, that, and because of that, typically I'll do my management of traces and folders on the interface um, rather than doing it in the data. But it can be done either way. Again, it's the same thing. This data here is really just a window into your computer's hard drive. Um, in fact, let's see, we've got a few things here that we don't necessarily need to save. So I'm going to delete them from the hard drive and let's see what happens. Uh, we'll go to documents, smart V8, traces, spectrum. And we've got this session data here. So uh, if I take this and I say delete voxmic.srf, move to trash it disappears in SMART as well. Again, SMART's just reading that data off of your hard drive. If you have older data from previous versions of SMART, for example, you have traces that were created in version five, you can bring those into version eight, just with the one exception, you can't bring in the old reference group uh, file, so that .rgp. I, uh, you can't take data that's new and go backwards, however. Um, but the legacy data is supported. Um, so we just talked about moving the data in the program or on the hard drive. Now here's some another thing we can do. If you have uh, multiple folders, you can actually create nests of them, um, just like you can in your hard drive. So for example, if I want to create a new folder uh, in the hamburger menu uh, here, new folder, now we have, uh, we'll just call it new folder. I can take my traces, uh, bring them into that folder. So now we have nested uh, traces. I can go and say I can make another new folder. New folder two. And this can, all, this can be nested as well, put around however you want to organize them. Um, the program's pretty flexible in that regard. So uh, what else do we have for data? We have trace info. So if you have a stored measurement and you right click and go to trace info or in the bottom left hand of the interface, you'll notice there's an info button that will show you pertinent uh, measurement info for when that was created. So you'll see we have all of the measurement settings, whatever they were when this measurement was created or captured, they're, they're stored as metadata for this info. Uh, now you can think, and we have basically two different things happen. We have, we have measurement settings and we have display settings. So I can take this measurement, which one are we looking at? We're looking at pink noise. So I can take this measurement, I can show it and I can change its display, I can change its banding, I can, I can do all this to this stored data. I can't change the averaging that was used when this data was created. Um, that's a measurement setting. So if you think of uh, this maybe as an analogy like, um, like looking at metadata for a photograph, uh, you, can, you can open up uh, the information that was developed or captured for that picture. Like what was that picture's, uh, I don't know, I'm not a photographer. So, uh, but you can 
take that same photo and look at it in Adobe and change the way it looks, but you can't change the contents of that photo. Um, here we can assign a weighting curve, for example, to this. Um, we're not changing the data, we're just changing the display of that data. So that's just some general information about what's in the data folder, in, in the data register in terms of folders. Now, uh, what I want to really hammer home here is the session data, uh, this whole session data format. So there's one folder that's always pinned to the top of your data bar, um, and that's, that's the session folder. Uh, so to, as a good working rule um, process, before you start creating any data, me you know, capturing any measurements, the first thing I'd recommend you do when you open up SMAR and get ready is to go to the hamburger menu and create a new session folder. The session folder is gonna be named whatever the date on your computer system is, and then you can add to that. So I can say April 3rd, this is uh, SOFO session three. And now we have a data, uh, a, a data folder that's given that name and it's gonna, everything we capture is gonna be put into that folder. It's gonna be pinned to the top of the data register for spectrum as well as transfer function data. So creating the session folder, no matter whether you create it as a, as a transfer function data view, it's gonna duplicate that folder for the .srf uh, or .trf uh, file type. This is just, I, I couldn't, I couldn't uh, you know, I, I use strong enough words how much I recommend doing this as your default process. Um, it keeps you really organized. Uh, if you have a bunch of different uh, session folders, you can always go in and recall them. They're all list here. They're all stored in your hard drive. It just makes your life really, uh, really easy rather than just having an ongoing um, list of measurements, um, not unlike how uh, the data register used to be in, in version 7. Um, so uh, all the data from that session folder, again, lives in between these two horizontal lines, and uh, and this session folder will remain until you manually change it. So uh, if I want to, say, look at traces or make this OctaCapture test. If I want this to be the new session folder, I can just click this, bring it up, and say, do I want to make this the new session folder? Sure. And so now anything I capture would be captured into this OctaCapture test. You don't have to do this to view data. Um, you can show high data at any point, no matter whether it's the designated session folder or not. It's just going to you know, be data that's being displayed from your hard drive. Uh, but again, whatever is the pin session folder at the top is what the data uh, that you capture is where it goes to. So um, let's, let's take a little break here on data capture. Uh, Michael, what's up? Uh, How you doing, Chris? Not too bad. Uh, I feel weird that Jamie is absolutely right talking to an empty room is bizarre. Uh, so how are we doing with the data bar? I think, uh, I think we're doing good. Can you talk a little bit about if you take you know, measurements, you want to import measurement data from another computer and look at it on a different installation of Smart, how you might do that? Sure. Uh, my preferred method is to just take that data and bring it into uh, your hard drive and just load that from here. Now, that's my preferred method. That doesn't mean that that's the only way you can do this. In other words, I would take, you know, someone sends me some files, I take those files, I copy them, and I paste them into the relevant spectrum or transfer function folder. Uh, once that's done, when you open Smart, Smart's gonna read that folder and just show you that data. Um, you could, you could also just tell Smart to look at a different folder. Um, so someone sends you a bunch of files, you put them on a folder on your desktop, you just tell Smart, set the folder directory to whatever that folder happens to be. Um, or from Smart, you could import uh, individual traces. Uh, I don't believe you can import an entire folder, you can import, but you can import many traces at a time. 
does that sort of cover that that question for you, Michael? It it does, and I, I there is a way to import a folder of data, but I won't import the subfolders, I believe. And also, uh, how about a quick mention of the way to export uh, a measurement data? Do you want to go to ASCII or something like that? Uh, sure. So if we let's uh, let's make some data real quick. Uh, we'll do just input one. Shoop. All right. So here's the, the vocal mic. I'll capture this. So um, that's fine. Turn it off. So we have uh, we have this uh, data capture. We can export this as ASCII, which will be basically a a, a text file. Um, it'll uh, or you can copy it to your clipboard and paste it into an Excel sheet. Um, let's see if I copy this and then open up text edit. Boom. So now we have uh, our frequency and the level, and uh, it's it's every um, it's every bin, right? So uh, it's basically the raw data for this measurement. Um, once you load that back into Smart, then you can use Smart's display settings to to uh, view that as you like. But as far as the export goes, we're we're exporting essentially the raw the raw measurement. Um, just to, to piggyback on that, Chris, the the export will respect whatever banding setting you've chosen. So um, if you use octave banding when you export that, you'll see the, the octave banded data. So here's octave banding. And then we'll export. Um, we'll save it to the desktop. See, did we did we save it? There it is, and then you can see that we have the octave banding applied. Neat. Um, I will admit that is not something I typically use very often, but it is there. It is there should you need it. All right. Yeah, I think uh, I think that pretty much covers all our questions on that. So, um, do you want to go back to uh, the full screen PowerPoint and jump into some some DI version two stuff? Sure. All right. So, uh, what is DI? Uh, DI is is basically a subset of version eight. Um, we came out with DI uh, during version seven, and its original name was version seven DI. Uh, DI stands for dual channel interface. Now, unlike version seven or version eight, where you can look at as many inputs as you have simultaneously, uh, you're limited to just looking at two inputs at once with smart DI. Um, that doesn't mean you can't have more than two inputs connected. It just means that you're only going to be able to display two of them running at a time or uh, one transfer function pair. So, uh, this leads me to what we were talking about earlier. We haven't covered transfer functions yet. Um, I'm not going to talk about what a transfer function is, uh, but I'm going to talk about its configuration with respect to DI in the, later on in this session. So with DI, as it's currently called, we dropped the version number to, from it, so uh, it's just DI version 2 now. It's basically a wrapper for version 8's real-time mode. Uh, it's more similar in terms of different. And if you're someone that only uses DI, jumping into version eight is not a difficult thing. It's not really, it, it's, you're gonna notice more similarities, similarities than there are differences. Of course, uh, the SPL functionality in DI is, is very limited compared to version eight or version uh, smart SPL. Uh, we'll do a video uh, later uh, in the series that's just concentrating on SPL. And there's also no impulse response mode with DI. So it's just the real time module. Um, you can do live impulse response measurement with DI just one at a time. Um, but again, the, the full impulse response mode that's available in version eight isn't part of DI. Uh, on our website, there's a, there's a full co uh, comparison list of what the different versions that we have offer. And you notice with VA and DI, again, that's it's sort of more similar than different. Um, and uh, you're, you're welcome to go to rationalacoustics.com, uh, and then this is under the Smart tab, and then which product is right for me. 
So with DI, again, it's almost the same as version eight. The primary difference with the IO configuration of DI is that unlike version eight, which has no input selected by default with version DI, it's the exact opposite. Everything is selected by default. And so if we look at version eight and IO config, the I've already selected to use Dante virtual sound card, but nothing else is selected. And, and even in here, not every input is selected. If I were to select, uh, uh, deselect this, you know, everything goes away. So let's, let's look at what this looks like in DI. So in DI, if I open up IO config, so config, IO config, or if you're on your way to becoming a smart ninja, uh, the command is alt A. You'll notice that every input that's connected to my system is currently being chosen as an input. Uh, this is really handy with DI. Because everything's already chosen, I don't need to uh, configure you know, measurement engines. You're only looking at two, at two inputs at a time. So I can basically swap through the different inputs that I have right here from DI's control bar. So again, why would we do that? It's just to keep the interface simple. Um, you'll notice in version eight, there's two separate control bars, one for spectrum and one for transfer function. DI takes the spectrum and transfer function control bar and you know, gives it a, a, a spin so that it's, it's all in one, one area. So right from the top level of the interface of DI, you can do everything that you would need to do in terms of acquiring different signals. Uh, you'll notice that you have uh, the ability to change whatever device is connected um, for right, right here from the top level, uh, as well as the inputs for the spectrum. And then the inputs for the spectrum determine the transfer function pair. So let's do a little bit of configuration in DI because I actually want to name these inputs not by their default name, but by a friendly name that I'm going to give them. So uh, we'll go to the input device configuration. Uh, we're using Dante virtual sound card and we'll select, this is the vocal mic. Uh, this is mic one, mic two, mic three. Channel five is my DSP out. Uh, six is the gen direct from smart. Uh, seven, we're not going to use, and eight is the console out. Right. So now that I've got friendly names for each of these inputs, they're now being reflected here as the individual inputs for those, those spectrum measurements. So again, we can only look at two inputs at a time, but I have more than two inputs connected, and I can just patch between them uh, right here in the spectrum channel. So let's we'll say... Uh, oh, looks like I didn't press enter when I wrote input eight. So let's change that. So that's the mix out, enter. Okay. So I've got the vocal mic and the mix output. I could do mic one and the mix out. And we just, you know, it just changes the patch. The program just changes the patch. So uh, the controls for running these measurements, showing and hide, again, it's the exact same as version eight. The program is, is in many ways more similar than it's different. You know, so running the measurement, um, you know, show hide of that live trace. You have the averaging, uh, you have the averaging of that measurement, the banding, it's again, it's the same as in version eight. It's just rather than spectrum having its whole own control bar, it's just, there's just one control bar for version eight. It's just one top level. So you'll notice that we have a green and a blue, and those correspond to the transfer function configuration for DI. So that green, that input one for your spectrum is always the measurement signal in the transfer function pair. The blue input two is always the reference signal for your transfer function. Now, this is just really great if you have a stereo interface. If you're, if you're someone that just uses one microphone, you have a two in, two out stereo interface, just connecting that to your computer, launching DI, connect your measure microphone to input one, connect your reference to input two, select that device as your input, and boom, you're done, you're configured. 
uh, it's really it really just you know makes makes your life pretty easy in that respect. Um, now, if you have more than one microphone connected, say for example you have three microphones connected like we do, uh, well. I can patch between those microphones. I can say, all right, I want to change the measurement input to my transfer function to input two. And so now that is going to update this transfer function configuration. Now, I know that we haven't talked about transfer function measurements in this series. Again, we're just, we're just covering the configuration here in DI so that those of you that do have DI, once we get there, you'll be able to follow right along. So if I have mic one, versus mix out and if I run the output here right so there's our there's our two measurements now say that's my first transfer function pair right so that's my that's mic one versus uh, mix out and I want to save save that so I can recall it well that's where this aperture icon comes into play so this is, a, this is a special case, right? This is the only place where this exists in the smart platform, is right here in the control bar next to the hammer and wrench to get to measurement configuration. So if I say I want to store this configuration as a transfer function pair, I'll go, okay, save pair. We'll call this mic one versus console, or we'll call it mix, okay? And so now that's mic one versus mix. So now I have mic two. And so we just ch that just changed the transfer function back to default. All right, well, let's capture that. Let's say, okay, well, this is going to be mic two versus mix. All right. So now we've got two transfer functions configured, mic one and mic two. Now we have a third microphone, so we'll go to mic three. And I'll capture this. I'll save this pair. So this will be mic three versus mix. And now I can basically virtually patch between my three microphones that are out there in our in our measurement area. Uh, so just because you can only look at one transfer function measurement at a time doesn't mean you can't run more than one transfer function with different inputs. It's just again, you can only look at one at a time. Uh, when we get to transfer function measurements later on in the series, you'll notice that with DI, the base, basically where this comes down to play as far as a, a maybe a, a maybe a, 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 I don't want to say a handicap, but just uh, the nature of the program is that you can't do live averages. Um, with version 8, you can do live averages of all your inputs. You can look at everything simultaneously. If I wanted to do an average of multiple positions in DI, I just have to average that stored data. So again, this is stuff that we're going to cover in future webinars, um, averaging measurements, uh, you know, multiple transfer functions, all this stuff. It's just, it's out of the scope for, for today. Um, you'll notice as well, uh, once we get into version eight, that the smoothing, uh, you have smoothing for both uh, phase and magnitude with DI. It's just one smoothing control. And again, it's just, in the essence of simplicity. So in the effort to have uh, as simple of an interface as possible, something that you can really get going very quickly, especially for those of you, again, that are using a stereo interface, one microphone. If you don't need impulse response mode, you don't need all those SPL features, uh, DI is gonna give you give you the, the real-time measurements, the spectrum and the transfer function measurements that, that uh, sort of make up the bread and butter of, of this platform. So uh, let's see. I know that was um, that was a lot in a short amount of time, um, but uh, what do we have for for questions? Well, Chris, let's talk about the API for a second. If someone's got uh, Smart uh, DI or Smart Eight and they want to use the API, what do they need to know? Okay, uh, so the API. Um, uh, so for the, uh, smart, we haven't, we haven't talked about the API at all. Uh, there's, there's the ability to broadcast measurement data from smart as well as receive commands from third party programs. 
um, for example, Lake uh, Controller or PowerSoft, PowerSoft Armonia, or if you're using maybe Waves, uh, the I believe it's called Tracked, the plugin. Um, these programs all take data from our API. So uh, the first thing to make that happen is, well, you just need the computer that's running smart that's going to be dishing up signal via the API to be on the same network as a device that's receiving that, um, that information. Once you have that, then enable your API. You can password protect it. Um, and then you can remotely log in uh, from a different computer. So uh, does, does DI have a client window? Right, so if, if we have two copies of DI, one, you know, maybe one on a tablet computer, um, and this is the same for version eight, uh, and you open up the view menu and go to client window, if you're broadcasting your API, you can actually remotely log into that, uh, that host that's broadcasting the API and basically control smart remotely um, from smart. So this can be a really nice handy thing. And, and uh, you'll notice even on the interface, this bottom area of the screen where you have the uh, command bar, the whole reason why the command bar is there originally was, well, if you're on a tablet and you don't have a keyboard, there's a way to access some of the hotkeys you'd otherwise use um, when you're on a client window. Is that covering what you're, what you're after, Michael? Yeah, and I, I would just add to that that, uh, you know, when you buy a, a, a license of Smart, you're going to get uh, two license seats. So you could use one of your seats to control the other one. So uh, DI can control DI and VA can control DA. Um, and the other question uh, that just came in for you, Chris, is in DI, does the averaging and smoothing settings change with each snapshot or are they locked globally for all snapshots? It's a global, uh, it's a global uh, setting, right? So if I were to change um, smoothing, it's it's this it's it's a global setting. So here's our three different transfer functions we've configured, and the smoothing doesn't change with them. There we go. I think uh, I think I think that's covered all the stuff that's popped up in the chat so far. All right. Cool. Again, for more information on DI, just head to our website uh, rationalmusics.com, and then you can look at the uh, the different versions uh, the versions there. DI is you know, at its core, it's, it's basically a third less of the functionality of version eight because you don't have the impulse response mode. You don't, you, you don't have, uh, you just have the spectrum and transfer function stuff. So um, it is at a slightly lower price point um, and it's a great way to get into measurement if it's your first, your first uh, uh, version of smart. I, I mean, to tell you the truth, I use both uh, a lot. In fact, if I'm doing just a sort of throw and go type of thing where I only have one microphone, I'm more often not going to open version A, I'll open DI because I'm just looking at one input, uh, one reference, so there it is. Um, you know, so it's, it's you know, again, there's not necessarily always one size fits all, but uh, DI makes a, makes a very compelling case for a, for a simple version of Smart. Yeah, I'll just echo that because you like you showed earlier, Chris, uh, and people might want to go back and take a look at this because it's important, you know, when you're using DI, um, you don't have to go through the additional steps of going in and choosing your audio interfaces and choosing your inputs like like Chris showed. They're all right there for you. Um, and I do want to just throw out to let people know um, if they do go to rationalacoustics.com and they can download um, the Smart uh, version 8 demo and the uh, DI version 2 demo. And we've just extended the time on both of those demos uh, to 90 days. So even if you've already downloaded the demo already and you were using it to follow along with this class, maybe the, the time has run out. You can go and you can read down both of those demos and you can use them both for 90 days. So definitely check those out at uh, rationalacoustics.com. Great. All right. So I guess that, that concludes uh, today's webinar. Thanks for uh, joining in, everybody.